Um, so I guess I'll get started uh, applying the appropriate biostatistics for clinical research. And if there are questions as I go through, feel free to ask them as we're going through. So I worry that if we wait until the end, you might find it is because it's, it's a lot of content. I've tried to distill a lot of core principles into basically 60 slides. Um, the ob objectives obviously distinguish inferential from different from descriptive statistics, classify the type of data, review measures of association, delineate the steps to completing statistical analysis, and then we're going to talk about some examples and troubleshoot um, with your current studies or statistical issues with your own projects. Um, basically, I started with a very heavy um, background, so just applying statistical uh, concepts, you could read a paper and look at the little chart and look at the different types of statistics that they are, but if you don't have a good understanding of the background of why we do them, what types of data you're looking at, and how to apply them, you'll still get results from those statistics, but they, they will most likely be wrong. So I focus really heavily on some background to make sure we understand core concepts before I go into more detail on the actual tests. So even though the presentation is supposed to be about statistical tests, there's a lot of stuff you need to know before you go and apply those tests. And obviously, disclaimer, I'm not a content expert, I'm not a biostatistician. Uh, I'm working on a PhD in epidemiology, but I'm like just starting. So I do have some experience through my PhD classes and my fellowship, but I am by no means the be-all end-all of this content. So Biostats 101, it's a method and statistical process in order to draw conclusions about the population at large based on your study sample. So basically, when you take your study sample, you want to have a simple random sample from the, populate, the underlying population of interest. And then you want, when you're doing your analysis of this population, you want to describe an event or occurrence and determine if the observation is truly significant or due to chance. And we'll talk about that as we go throughout the project, the uh, talk. But basically, the concept of simple random sample is important because you are taking just a small sample of your overall patient population of interest. Analysis tends to be either descriptive or inferential. Uh, there's other types of analysis, but I think for most clinical research projects, we focus on either descriptive or inferential. Descriptive includes summarizing available data and analysis of patterns. Uh, inferential is allowing, uh, looking at generalizations about a larger population of interest on the study uh, sample being collected. Um, a lot of our inferential statistics are what we're going to be talking about later. I'm going to start with descriptive. Uh, we tend to do them without really thinking about them, but they are actually really important to help describe the underlying data that you're actually analyzing. So types of data, I think everyone knows types of data, but I have to just put it in here to make sure we're all like familiar with it. There's basically discrete and continuous. Discrete um, probability of occurrence of each value is disconnected a random variable. So your random variable can be binary, it could be nominal, it could be ordinal. Uh, continuous describes probabilities of a continuous random variable. It could be interval or ratio. Does, any, does people remember what interval and ratio are? I got like blank stares. Um, hello, do you know what it is? Okay, so interval and ratio have to do with whether or not there's a true zero. So let's go through some examples. Um, so age, that's obviously continuous, right? It's not discrete. It is it has a true zero, so it's interval. Um, length of stay has a true zero. Temperature in Celsius, does that have a true zero? No, right, because it goes into the negatives. Uh, what, what's pit bacteremia score? Is that continuous? Well, it's a score where you have ranked points. I was hoping, black, how's the blackboard people? Is anyone? No, it's, it's ordinal, right? Because you have a score, it's discrete variables. They're not actually, the points between the scores are not measured the same. Like a pit factor of one versus pit factor of score of four doesn't necessarily mean that it's four times more risk of mortality. Like it's not like, interval where your age, if someone has, uh, or a ratio, sorry, ratio where your age um, has twice as much, I'm not explaining this right, but you know how if your age is two times as much, you go from 20 to 40, you're able to make that comparison, you're not able to do that with pit bacteremia score, or, yeah, pain scale, it's the same thing as a RAS score, those are ordinal, 
they're discrete, you don't have, they're not continuous, you don't have a RAS score of 2.3333, so they're not continuous, so they're discrete, um, and they are ordered, they're rank ordered, they're not nominal, it's not like uh, race or gender, they are actually rank ordered, so that makes them ordinal. And then patients with an ID consult, what type of data is that? Nominal, yeah, it's binary. It can be, binary is a type of nominal. Uh, nominal can be uh, multiple categories. Binary is just a, like basically a yes, no. So that's some types of data that you work with, and you have to really consider um, what type of data you have when you're building out your data set, because that's going to hugely affect not only how you collect it, but how you analyze it in the end. So descriptive statistics, measures of central tendency. Um, these are important just to describe your underlying data. We all know mean and median means the mathematical average. It's affected by outliers and extreme values, which is important. Um, so if you have a lot of, if you've got a couple of patients who are outliers, say you're looking at your patient population age, and mostly they're in the 40s or 50s, but you've got a couple 90-year-olds, it's going to skew your data just because the mean is very sensitive to those values. But then if you have your median, which is your 50th percentile, um, that's unaffected by outliers. It tends to be more resistant. And usually we work in smaller data sets when we're doing these single center small retrospective projects. I know I do. I tend to use the median a lot more than mean um, because it's good for smaller data sets with extreme values because it's resistant to those outliers. Also looking at descriptive statistics, measures of spread. So obviously with your mean or median, you have a point estimate in your data, but you also want to look at the variability around that point estimate within your data or your sample population. Uh, measures of variability include variance, standard deviation, and standard error. There's also descriptive formats, uh, including interquartile range, distance, and min-max. And I'll talk about those in the upcoming slides. So variance is the average square distance from the mean in the sample population. And then standard deviation is just the square root of that variance. It describes the distribution of data around the mean in your sample population. So it gives you an idea of how precise your estimate is in your sample population. Well, actually, sorry, standard error is the estimate of precision in your study sample. So that's something I always used to get confused about. The standard deviation is your square root of variance, describes your population. The standard error describes your study sample. So remember I said that you're looking at a study sample from your study population. So you're really interested in your standard error, which is your standard deviation divided by the square root of your study sample size. So that's what you want to look at when you're trying to look at the uh, variability around your mean so you look at the overall precision of that estimate. So examples of descriptive formats. Um, descriptive formats include range and interquartile range. So we see interquartile range used a lot in non-normally distributed data presentations. Um, when we have a median, we want to look at the 25th and 75th percentile to try and get an idea of what the um, dispersion is around that estimate. And again, it's a stable measure of spread, so when you have outliers, it's resistant to that. Um, throughout the presentation, I'm going to have a reference to this paper I did when I was a fellow because we did a lot of these statistics in it, so it's just a good background to continuously draw back to, and I've got the raw data files to look at. But this is an example. We see the length of stay, the frequency by patient in our daptomycin treatment group for this study where we're looking at vancomycin versus daptomycin. I just want to make sure when I'm looking at these two groups that we've collected that the length of stay is similar between the two groups so that's not um, unbalanced. If I just want to look at that, I can look at doing uh, frequencies. I can look at the mean, the median, the standard deviation, and the percentiles. Obviously, looking at the histogram, we can already tell it's not normally distributed. So it's got some outliers here that might pull your mean away. And you can see the mean is actually much higher than the median, right? So looking at that, I'd say I'm going to use the median and the interquartile range to describe my point estimate and my dispersion of my data because it's obviously not normally distributed and that mean is very sensitive to these, like this dude out here at 80 days length of stay is really driving that mean up. Does that kind of make sense? Just making sure. Um, and then if I want to look at the median to describe the dispersion around it, I'd look at the 25th and 75th percentile, being our interquartile range. 
Also looking at descriptive statistics, confidence intervals, uh, 95% confidence intervals, a set of parameter values formed by a procedure, if used repeatedly, will contain the true parameter 95% of the time. So 95% confidence interval is not that when you have an interval, you have a 95% probability of having the true parameter. Did anyone take a look at that p-value paper I sent out? Okay. It is very confusing to think about the language of probabilities, and that's where as clinical researchers we get really hung up, is because we don't understand how we're actually applying these probabilities, because we're really applying the probabilities to our um, data set, but we're also looking at the probability if we, re if we do this repeatedly. So we're not just saying, okay, this is applying only to the data we just collected. No, it's applying in the context of if we had done this using that same uh, model, using the same model parameters repeatedly. So if you were to do your same study 100 times, 95% of the time you'd have the true parameter estimate contained within that 95% confidence interval. So if that 95%, so if you're looking at maybe a mean change in something, if that 95% confidence interval contains zero, is it likely that you found a true change in your population? No, right? Because there is a chance that if you use repeatedly, you will find a null effect. So that's kind of how 95, how I'm trying to explain 95% confidence intervals. So, and we'll come back to 95% confidence intervals again when we look at relative risks and odds ratios in a couple slides. But relative risks and odds ratios, I think, are used a lot in clinical literature, so I just wanted to go through them quickly. Relative risk versus odds ratio, this took me a while to figure out when I was first starting. Uh, I, started, I started a master's when I was a fellow. Um, so I didn't finish it. I came here. I'm like, nope, bye. And then I didn't transfer anything, but that's a different story. Um, so when we first started, like Epi 101, odds ratio versus risk ratio, I'm trying to explain that was hard. But basically, your odds and your risk are kind of different in terms of the denominator you're looking at, right? So if you're looking at the odds of something happening, it's non the denominator is non-inclusive of, of the actual event. So when you're looking at the odds of heads, it's a one-to-one. -one. But if you're looking at the risk of heads, that includes the, the other event, so it's a one and two. Looking at rolling a dice, odds is one and five. Um, risk, of, risk of rolling a dice is one and six, because it's a six-sided die, right? This is why the blackboard things, I have no idea if they're understanding me. <laughs> I have some no head nods in the room, so I'm going to go with that. Um, and when the outcome is of interest is relatively rare, the, the odds ratio may approximate the risk ratio. And we'll talk about that when we talk about different study designs briefly. So the odds that an outcome will occur, so the odds ratio is the odds the outcome will occur in your exposure compared to the odds it will occur in the absence of the exposure. So you're basically taking two odds and dividing them, right? It's a ratio. And we typically, when we're doing these types of studies where we're looking at exposure, no exposure, outcome, no outcome, we create this little two-by-two two table, right? I'm sure people have seen these before. Um, and basically, when you take Epi 101, you just learn this A, A divided by C over B divided by D, or A times D divided by C times B, and it just gets drilled into your head. But the idea is if you take the odds of your of your event over your uh, exposure, divide it by the odds in your controls, you'll get the odds ratio of having that outcome given your exposure. And it is uh, directional. So an odds ratio greater than one is associated with a higher odds of the outcome in your cases. An odds ratio of less than one is associated with the lower odds of the outcome in your cases. Obviously, assuming that you put your cases on top, always make sure, oh, you, what, okay. <laughs> Always make sure you know which one you've put on top of your ratio to make sure you're aware of the directionality. And obviously an odds ratio of one, it does not affect the outcome. Measures of association, relative risk. This is the ratio of your probability or cumulative incidence of an outcome in the exposed divided to the probability or cumulative incidence of the outcome in the unexposed. So you can see that denominator includes the people who got the disease as well as those who didn't. So that's different than the odds, right? The odds were just divided by B, not A plus B, so that's how they're different. That goes back to the rolling of the dice and the coin toss example. Um, relative risk also has directionality. Relative risk uh, equals one is uh, the same for exposed versus non-exposed. 
greater than one risk is of, uh, for exposed x times greater than that for non-exposed, less is x times less than for non-exposed. So again, directionality. You can also apply confidence intervals to your risk ratios and odds ratios for your study sample. And similar to my example where I said if it had, if your 95% confidence interval contained a zero when you're looking at maybe a mean change, if your risk ratio or odds ratio 95% confidence interval contains a one, you're likely not finding a difference between your exposed and unexposed, right? So this is just an example from, again, that same paper where I was looking at um, MRSA versus daptomycin. The primary outcome there was uh, clinical failure. So these are different predictors I looked at, and these are the odds ratios between Vanco versus Dapto. Um, and then these are the 95% confidence intervals. You can see um, that Roth microdilution crosses one, so it's likely not significantly impactful, where infective endocarditis, Vanco, ICU admission are all greater than one, and then source control is less than one. So just as a side note, I did see some posters at ID Week that did look at um, looking at odds ratios, and then they also did multivariable analysis, which also outputs odds ratios. They put all the list of the um, independent predictors and the p-values, and that was it. Don't do that. that. That doesn't help anyone. I don't. I don't care what the p-value is. I have no idea what the effect size is. I have no idea what the actual spread of that data is either. So. If you have odds ratios, report them and report the 95% confidence interval. And as we'll talk about as we go through, these confidence intervals and looking at this, like the dispersion of your data is actually more valuable than just having your clear cutoff of p-value. So before I get into the actual statistical test, I want to also review test accuracy. This is something that comes up for me pretty often in ID. I'm not sure if it does for other people, but I, I frequently go through sensitivity and specificity um, with different projects as well as different trainees. For instance, looking at our CDIF testing and how that's changed. So sensitivity, the ability to, of a test to detect the disease when the disease is truly present so that's your true positives over your true positives plus your false negatives, right? So true positives and false negatives are everyone that actually has the disease. So sensitivity is your how many were detected versus how many actually had the disease. Um, specificity, the ability to test your lie to detect the absence of disease. So your true negative over true negative plus false positive, which is the corollary of the first. And sensitivity and specificity are both important to a diagnostic. I know there's the spin and snout uh, acronyms about ruling in and ruling out, but they're both important to look at the overall accuracy of the test. And also important when you're reading different tests for different diagnostics that you might be using in your different practices, sensitivity and specificity is intrinsic to the test itself. So, when, so next we're looking at positive and negative predictive value. That's really what you're interested in once you actually apply it to your patient. So positive predictive value is the proportion of individuals who have the disease uh, in, as indicated by a diagnostic test. So true positive over true positive plus false positive. Negative predictive value is a proportion without the disease when the ap within the absence of disease is indicated by a diagnostic test. So this isn't inherent to your diagnostic test. This is actually inherent to your population of interest. So positive predictive value, we see what's neat about it, as I've shown here with this I was quite proud of myself um, for many things on this slide, including this graph. So it shows with C. diff prevalence how your positive predictive value goes from being really poor when you have a low prevalence to being pretty good when you have a high prevalence. So your prevalence really impacts your ability to have a true positive, right? Because if you have a low positive predictive value, that means that your false positive rate is high in driving up that denominator, right? So you're having a lot of false positives, which we worry about, especially with our C. diff tests and the PCRs. That's exactly what this paper is looking at. And that kind of goes back to why you need to have a high pretest probability, um, which is a whole other concept of these, but we're not going to talk about that. But the point is, if you have a high pretest probability, it's like having an incidence up here as opposed to down here. So you decrease your risk of false positives. <clears throat> 
So most studies you look at for diagnostics are going to go over sensitivity and specificity. They probably won't go over positive and negative predictive value because they're looking at the test itself. But realize that those are intrinsic to the test and don't 100% correlate to your patient. Does that make sense? No? <laughs> okay, we'll talk about that after. <laughs> we'll talk more about that after. Okay, so what everyone actually cares about, steps to completing statistical analysis. So, oh, is there, no? I'm good? Okay. Um, steps to complete statistical analysis. There's a lot more than just running the statistic. In fact, running the statistic is down here at number seven in the steps to complete statistical analysis. Because you can, you can put data in Excel, you can put data in SPSS, and you can run a bunch of statistics and get p-values all day long. It doesn't mean they mean anything. Um, so to start, I want to start from the very, from the very beginning, looking at your question to be answered by the study. So statement of the question to be answered, often um, in our clinical research, we look at the comparison of outcomes between groups, i.e. treatment groups. We need to make sure that the question is clearly defined and measurable. Um, we can't just say, oh, I want to look at daptomycin use in our hospital. I don't know what that means. What are you comparing it to? What do you, what do you mean by use? You know what I mean? Like, well, I want to look at whether or not daptomycin has better outcomes than vancomycin. Again, you need to define what does that mean? What's your outcome? I mean, I don't know you're looking at daptomycin versus vancomycin, but what do you mean by better outcomes? You want to look at your population, too. Um, is it all types of infections? Does it have better outcomes in bone and joint, or is it bloodstream infections you're interested in? Are you looking at whether or not they had cultures or not? So you have to clearly define your population within your study question, as well as clearly define your exposure. And obviously, clearly define your outcome. So when you're starting, the first thing you do when you're starting a study is really nail down what the study question is to be answered before you start going on to any other steps. Really try and make it as concrete and measurable as possible. So again, looking at this paper that I keep mentioning, it's uh, looking at daptomycin versus vancomycin. It's an MRSA bloodstream infections. They had to have at least one positive blood culture for MRSA. They had to re receive 72 hours of therapy with one of these two agents. They could only be included once in the study. And they, could, um, they couldn't have a source of BSI that was pneumonia, uh, couldn't have an uh, uh, organism that was resistant to the study drug, and they couldn't have a polymicrobial infection. So just things like that, really defining what your population is. Um, it, it might limit some external generalizability, but it will help with internal validity of your study. So next, you kind of have an idea of what your actual study question is. You have to formulate your null and alternative hypothesis. So you guys have heard of null and alternative hypothesis before? Thank you. <laughs> some, some people are nodding. Um, the null hypothesis is a theory that there's no difference in the underlying data. Um, we, for instance, we assume there's no difference in clinical cure among patients treated with antibiotic A compared to antibiotic B. The alternative is that there is a difference. And our statistical tests work to test which one, the null or the alternative. Yeah, we are, we're, trying, we're testing the null hypothesis. The alternative is there for us, but we're working at testing the null hypothesis. So if you take a look at that p-value paper I sent you, you have to keep in mind that that's the, that's the reference they're coming from because they keep saying accepting and rejecting the null. And the p-values, if you're thinking about from the, from the um, pr um, perspective of the alternative hypothesis, you're going to be very confused by that paper. So null and alternative, so statistical test calculates the probability of obtaining the observed data or more extreme if the null hypothesis is correct. So how likely is it that your observed value is due to chance as opposed to a true difference? So it's looking at the strength against the null hypothesis. Uh, moving into more concepts that are kind of important to this that I wasn't sure where else to put. Type 1 and type 2 error. You guys have heard of these before, right? Um, <laughs> type 1 error, alpha is the probability of um, is alpha. So your p-value you all, we always talk about p-values and setting the p-value a certain thing. You're actually setting your alpha, and that's your probability of making a type 1 error. And your type 1 error is rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is, in fact, true. Your type 2 error um, is to accept the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is, in fact, false. So complementary in that regard. 
So, okay, moving on to the paper that I mentioned, uh, H0, the enol hypothesis, clinical failure, which we define as a composite of all-cause mortality, persistent bacteremia, and need to change therapy for MRSA is the same between patients with daftomycin versus vancomycin. We decided it was a two-sided test. I'll talk about that in a second. Type 1 error would be we conclude that DAP is better or worse than it actually, when it is actually the same as vancomycin. Type 2 error, we conclude there is no difference between DAPTO and vanco when there actually is. So you see how I applied it to the study? He said the objective in the paper was to determine that there's a difference in treatment outcomes in MRSA BSI treatment with vancomycin versus daptomycin, uh, regardless of the vancomycin MIC. Next, determination of study design. So I want to briefly go over common study designs because it's critically important that you actually know what your study design is when you're going into your study, right? I think we take this for granted a lot. Um, electronic medical chart review is not a study design. It's something you do when you're in your study, but it's not a study design. Studies can be either retrospective or prospective in nature. The majority of our studies tend to be retrospective, observational. Um, they can be, studies can be observational or experimental. We rarely get involved in experimental studies because they're a lot of work. Um, observational studies look at relationships and correlation. They can include case control, cohort, cross-sectional, and quasi-experimental. Um, and again, they look at correlations because they can't show direct causation because you don't have that time component that you do with a prospective study. A prospective experimental study, you assign the treatment group. For instance, randomized controlled trials. You can look at causation because you have that time component between the exposure and the outcome. So these are just basic reviews of the different types of trials, randomized controlled trial. They're randomized to receive a drug or not receive drug, and you look at outcome, no outcome, outcome, no outcome. It is actually fairly simple in terms of statistics on the back end, but it's really hard to actually do on the front end. Most of this stuff's going to be like chi-squared and t-test, right, because you don't have to do much uh, to address potential confounding in it because you've done that through the study design. But we don't have the time or resources to do that mostly. We look at cohort studies and uh, case control studies. I think cohort's probably the most common type we do. We look at exposure versus no exposure. And in the exposed, we looked at whether or not they got the disease. And in the no exposed, we looked at whether or not they got the disease, right? Case control studies, the opposite. We, look, we start from the disease and work our way back to the exposure. We look at people who have the disease and look at whether or not they got the exposure. Then we looked at people who did not have the disease and looked at whether or not they had the exposure. Um, do you guys know in terms of relative risk and odds ratio when you use relative risk versus odds ratio with case control versus cohort studies? <laughs> cohort? <laughs> well, it depends if you're going forward or backward, right? It does depend if you're going forward or back. What about case control study? Uh, relative risk or odds ratio? Yeah, odds ratio. Uh, you can't really do a relative risk because you don't know the cumulative incidence. You're starting from disease. Um, so you're picking people who have disease versus no disease, and you don't have your full denominator like you do with uh, cohort studies. Um, OK, so going back to the paper, <clears throat> this was a cohort study. We looked at daptomycin versus vancomycin. And we looked at clinical failure versus no clinical failure. It was actually a retrospective propensity matched cohort, um, but basically the overall study design was cohort. Determination of data structure. Um, obviously, you've got your dependent and independent variables. Your independent variable is your um, exposure or explanatory variable. Your dependent is your response or outcome variable. So for us, our dependent variable was our clinical outcome, which um, was a composite of things like all-cause mortality, um, persistent bacteremia, and these are that those variables are dependent on our explanatory variables, which could be ICU length of stay, a pit bacteremia score. Um, confounding variables are also important. They're associated with both dependent and independent variables that influence the relationship between the two. So they're not directly in the causal pathway between exposure and outcome, but they influence both. So they're they're associated with the uh, exposure and the outcome, and they can. Uh, influence it, but they're not in the causal pathway. There's a whole way that if you work on, say, 
uh, a cohort study and you're worried about some confounding variable and you're looking at odds ratios or risk ratios, um, you can actually look at whether or not they change based on the addition of this stratification of this confounder. That's probably a bit more than we need today, but just be aware that confounders are present and you should probably try and account for them, especially if you want to get into higher level statistics, which I'm not going to focus on too much today. But if you're like, oh, I really want to do a multivariable regression analysis, you need to collect those confounders because that's where you can really adjust for the, their presence. Um, it's important to determine what type of data you're collecting while making your data collection tool. Uh, this goes back to looking at what your actual question is and what kind of metrics you're collecting. But like I said, we've got the discrete and continuous data. Uh, important to realize that you can always collect higher order data and then transform it after you've collected it. So I like to actually collect when you're looking at length of stay and, or time from diagnosis to discharge. I like to actually collect the dates because I can calculate them on the back end. And then if I need to categorize them as like greater than seven days, less than seven days, I can also do that in the back end. Where if you just have your resident collect greater than less than seven days, you're stuck there. You can't go, there's no other type of data after nominal. You're stuck. So I like to have them collect that higher order data that we can manipulate on the back end. Uh, specification of the level of significance, the p-value. So hypothesis testing the p-value. It's a measure of how data observes varied from the null hypothesis. Uh, it's related to alpha, as we mentioned before. But you, so we usually see if a p-value is less than 0.05, we say it's statistically significant. Uh, that's an arbitrary cutoff. I think all of us are starting to realize that as more and more papers come out, that this 0.05 probably is not the end all, be all, end all. Uh, if the p-value is less than or equal to that alpha level, which we typically set 0.05, then the null hypothesis is rejected and the difference between the groups is considered to be statistically significant. But your ability to reach that 0.05 is affected by a lot of things. Uh, the effect size being measured, the sample size of the population, the deviance or the um, collection error in the observed sample. These all affect your ability to reach that p-value. Um, also looking at the underlying assumptions of the probability model that you're using. So if you have a p-value that's greater than 0.05, that doesn't necessarily mean that what you found isn't important. It could be affected by a, a myriad of things. Uh, additionally, if you have a p-value less than 0.05, again, it doesn't actually mean that it's the BL end all you found something that's important. If you have, like at card studies, are usually thousands upon thousands of patients, right? you're going to find statistically significant differences just based on the fact that you've got that large sample size. RID studies tend to be a lot smaller. We tend to have a hard time hitting this p-value with some of our smaller studies, especially with drug-resistant bacteria because we have so few patients to put in those studies. But if we see, for instance, I don't think I had this in the slides. No. Okay. Um, if we want to look at a 20% effect difference versus a 15% difference, you go from having some 260 patients to some three, 400 patients that you need just to show that 5% difference. So it, it really is um, very much dependent on a lot of things that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we don't necessarily consider. And that, <clears throat> sorry, um, that paper I sent talks a lot about how we need to look at the underlying um, probability distributions as well, which I don't even really go into a ton because that's higher level stuff that I'm not sure if I'm going to bore people with. Um, but basically, going back to the p-value, it's very arbitrary. This Basically, Ronald Fisher, this is his quote where he came up with the p-value in the 20s, uh, the p-value cutoff of 0.05. And we keep using it as the be-all, end-all. And it was more just something he wrote in a paper once, and we decided to run with it for almost 100 years. But now we're starting to realize that this arbitrary cutoff is probably doing more harm than good. We have a lot of people that just go hunting for p-values and try and find those significant values um, to report in their journal articles uh, and publications that don't necessarily mean that we're providing good quality research that's actually showing a true effect. So again, this goes back to that paper. It's not the probability that the null or return of the hypothesis is true. It's not the probability of getting the results you've got. It's not the probability that the result you got was due to chance alone. A large p-value is not strong evidence against, you know, hypothesis and so on. So that paper I sent 
has 20 misconceptions about p-values, confidence intervals, and power, the majority of which are dedicated towards the p-value. It really tries to explain the language behind looking at your probability distribution and how what you're testing is whether or not your sample matches what you'd expect your probability to be. Not, it's not the be-all, end-all um, looking just at your data. It's hard to explain, but I hope that paper does a good job because they're actually biostatisticians. Um, power, I've already mentioned beta. Power is 1 minus beta. It's a probability that the statistical test can detect a significant difference. Um, as alpha increases, you beta, beta decreases, power increases. Anyway, sample size is related to power. I'm just going to say that for this one. Sample size and the number of people being studied from a particular population. Elements of sample size, prevalence of the outcome or exposure of interest, desired detectable difference, variance, your alpha level, and your power. Um, clinically relevant uh, differences are important to determine effect size. And again, smaller effect size equals greater sample size. So this goes back to that example I was kind of mentioning earlier, your proportional difference. Um, if your powers in your alpha um, are the same, but your effect size is 20% versus 15%, you go from a 181 patients total to show that effect versus 334. So you can see how when you have a small sample size, it might be very difficult to hit that p to get a p-value of less than 0.05 because you need to have vastly different effect sizes that probably aren't realistic. Decision for a suitable statistical test is probably what most people actually were interested in an hour later. <laughs> um, considerations for deciding on a statistical test. So there's a lot of considerations before you actually decide which test to use. You obviously need to know what type of data you, you're, you're dealing with. What's your outcome data? What's your exposure data? So we already went over nominal, ordinal, ratio. You need to know what both of those are. You need to know whether or not your data is normally distributed. Uh, if it's not normally distributed, if, it, if it's distributed by another um, probability distribution. So whether it follows certain parameter assumptions versus not. Um, you need to know whether or not you're doing a one-side versus two-side hypothesis test. How many groups <coughs> you're comparing? Are your data independent or paired? and how you assess for the presence of founding. So there's a lot of steps, even once you just get to this step. So I already showed you like an eight-step process, and step six already has five more steps. So there's a lot of things you have to consider before you start running statistical tests. So families of probability distributions. Um, distributions um, can be either parametric or non-parametric. Mm -hmm. um, parametrics are defined by certain parameters. Uh, for instance, normal distribution is the one I think most people are familiar with. As distinguished by two parameters, the mean and standard deviation. Obviously, I showed you that uh, histogram earlier. It was not normally distributed; it was very skewed. But the nor but by looking at that histogram, I can see that it doesn't follow the assumptions for normal distribution. So I know that when I go and want to make any comparisons with that data, I have to use a different test that's not normally distributed. There's a bunch of different uh, types of distributions. Uh, the most often we look at normal distributions for continuous variables, and we also have chi-squared distributions that I think are probably the most common that people use. We sometimes use Poisson distribution, but if you're getting into that, go ask a biostatistician for help, is my recommendation. And the non-parametric tests are not governed by a set of parameters, so if you don't meet the assumptions of the test, you move to non-parametric tests. For instance, for instance, I'm going to talk about ANOVA in a slide, but there's three assumptions, independence, normal distribution, and homoscedacity. Um, homoscedacity is uh, equivalent to variance. So basically, if variance is the same throughout. Um, if those assumptions aren't met, you move to a non-parametric test. So this is my attempt to try and explain variables in your data have different distributions depending on the type of data you're collecting and you test whether your simple random sample differs from the underlying probability distribution more than would be expected by chance. So when you're applying your statistical test, you need to decide which, probability, which distribution you're looking at and then whether or not what you observe from that simple random sample of people you took actually differs from that distribution more than you would assume by chance. And there's a lot of different types of distribution we're more familiar with the normal distribution more than really anything else, I think. Are you guys familiar with one-sided versus two-sided tests? Somewhat. Um, two-sided really is the most commonly used. Um, we don't know the directionality. Um, so we basically, so this is supposed to be 
perfectly normal distribution. This is supposed to be like a normal distribution curve. Um, we basically have to put our probabilities at either end of the tail because we don't know the directionality. So for instance, my Vanko versus Dapto study, I could theoretically say based on previous studies, um, I don't I might not be able to say, I don't know if it's better or worse, so I have to use a two-sided test. If, based on previous studies, I know that it's not been shown to be worse, I could use a one-sided test. But usually people just do two-sided tests. Um, if you want to do one-sided test, it's a little less conservative, so you might want to explain why you're using it. And that's, as you can see, it's less conservative because you have all of your probability in one tail. Bias and confounding. Quickly, just to go over this to make sure everyone's kind of aware of them, bias is a systematic design or contact that distorts association. It relates to the study's internal validity and can't be fixed with analysis. Confounding, on the other hand, occurs when the observed result between exposure and outcome differs from the truth because of an influence of a third variable. So like I showed you earlier, that can be fixed with uh, study design or analysis. You can do matching to control for the confounder. So you can match on that confounding variable. You can, after you uh, collect the data, stratify by that confounding variable. Or you can do regression analysis and to account for that confounding variable. So types of statistical analysis. Basically, I think most people are going to end up doing univariant, which is what we talked about with distributions of frequency of data. Bivariate, which is your crude or unadjusted association between two variables. Some people might get into multivariable. Uh, that's where you look at your controlling for confounding. <coughs> Very few of us, I think, will get into multivariate. That's when you have multiple outcomes. Um, side note, a lot of studies will say multivariate analysis when they're actually talking about multivariable. Um, if it's a binary logistic regression, <coughs> Um, we have an out one outcome, a yes or no outcome, that's a multivariable analysis. If it's got multiple outcomes, that's a multivariate analysis. But most, most papers say multivariate when they mean multivariable. Just a pet peeve of mine in the side note. Um, so multivariable is like a yes, no. So did they develop acute kidney injury? Yes, no. Uh, multivariate might be, so I did a multivariate, multivariate, regression analysis for one of my papers where we looked at patient distribution after ED for skin infection. It was ED versus OU versus admission. So multiple outcomes. Where multivariable is a yes, no, but you're accounting for multiple variables, your covariates for confounding, right? So your multivariable is your variables that go into the model. Your outcome is still this yes, no metric. So you know when you see multivariable regression analysis, it says we controlled for X, Y, and Z for our primary outcome. So if, am I making sense? OK. <laughs> Did that answer the question? OK. Selection of statistical tests. The first one, looking at binary or nominal, you, your most common is going to be your chi-squared or Fisher exact. But you can see you need to know what type of data you have. Uh, you need to know whether or not it's paired. And then you need to know your accounts, your estimated counts. So most commonly, you'll use chi-squared. If the expected count in one of your cells is less than 5 to 10, you use Fisher exact. But basically, the chi-squared looks at your observed versus your expected and looks how much what you observe differs from your expected based on the chi-squared probability distribution. Oh, and for categorical, if there's greater than two comparators, you do this the same as above, but you correct uh, for multiple comparisons. Um, basically, same with some of the other tests we look at. When you get into having more than two groups, you can look at your overall significance. Your hypothesis might be, your null hypothesis might be, there is no difference between X, Y, and Z. But then if, if you find that there is a difference, you just know there's a difference between X, Y, and Z. You don't know if it's a difference between X and Y, Y and Z. You don't know where that difference lies yet, right? So you then have to do a series of multiple comparisons. But when you do these multiple comparisons, you increase your risk of, doing, of uh, causing a type 1 error because you're constantly doing uh, multiple tests on the same data. So you have to adjust your level of significance to account for the fact that you're doing these multiple comparisons. Is the easiest way I can think of that. Yes. <laughs> 
So it might say, so does that pop up after you do the calculation? It says Fisher's <coughs> act is preferred after you do the calculation? Before. Fisher exact's more conservative than the chi-squared, um, meaning you're less likely to get a significant value. Um, I, I don't think that's necessarily wrong, but I also don't know why it would do that. Does that make sense? I'm assuming if you have a large enough sample size, it would, it, once you get to a large enough sample size, it wouldn't matter, but when you're in those smaller ones, there's also stuff in here that I didn't talk about looking at, um, corrections for smaller data sets between 10 and 50, um, that it, this like Yates correction and things like that. There's things that you do with smaller data sets. I'm assuming you're not working in the thousands, right? Yeah. So I, I think they're probably just saying the Fisher exact because it's more conservative, especially with smaller data sets. That would be my guess why they're doing that. I should put my disclaimer too. I don't use GraphPad. Um, I've never used GraphPad. I know that most people do. So that's like a big hindrance to me helping with certain things because I do not understand what that program does. But I can answer general theoretical questions. Um, yeah, so this is basically the um, chi-square Fisher exact from SPSS. Um, it looks big because I put in basically every type of percentage expected. The expected count for each cell, I put percent within your ICU versus percent within your treatment group. And you can see it says Pearson chi square, but up here there's a little A it says two cells may expect to count less than five. Um, so it just gives you the Fisher exact. And it was a two-sided test. Um, next, looking at selection of tests, um, looking at your continuous data, you need to look at whether or not continuous data is normally distributed or not normally distributed. If it's normally distributed, you might use one of these parametric tests. It also depends if it's paired or unpaired. So paired is like, um, studies where you might give them a treatment, do a washout and give them another treatment. It's the same human being getting the same treatment, right? So that's paired data. We usually work on unpaired data. So two groups, we use a student t-test to compare means. I think that's what most people are very, are used to. More than two groups, we use the ANOVA. So ANOVA can detect at least uh, two groups in comparison. They look at the means. Like This is basically saying what I said earlier but they can't tell you which group's different from each other. So if you've got three or four groups, it will tell you that there's a difference there. It just won't tell you where the difference actually lies. Because your, your um, null hypothesis is that there is no difference between those number of groups. And then paired, paired t-tests and repeated measures ANOVA. If your data is continuous, but it doesn't meet uh, the assumptions for normal distribution, most, most commonly it's not normally distributed. Like you do a histogram, it looks skewed. You're like, this is not normally distributed. I need to use a non-parametric test. Again, you can look at paired versus unpaired. Most likely we'll be using paired, I mean unpaired. Two groups, it's gonna be the man, Whitney, you. Uh, greater than two groups, the cross gal Wallace. So this is an example of the, I had to put together for a reviewer what my independent dependent variables are on my statistical test in my paper. I don't know why, I've never been asked to do that before or again, but I'll just show you kind of what happens here. So you can see our independent variable was the treatment group, dependent age between the treatment group. So it was continuous, it was normally distributed. We did t-test, we compared the means. Length of stay, as we saw, wasn't normally distributed, so we did man Whitney U. Um, categorical variables, treatment group again was Banco versus Dapto. It's either chi-squared or Fisher exact. So that makes sense after what I've said kind of, maybe. This table's for your reference. It basically covers what I said in one giant table. I was hoping there'd be more people here, <laughs> actually in the room. Um, so the example, studying evaluating the difference in SPP before and after new blood pressure medication um, showed a reduction in the SPP of a mean of 4.6%, uh, which of the following statistical tests is most appropriate for analysis. So things to think about, what type of data is it? Continuous. Um, is it so you have to make an assumption here, but you would, based on the answers I gave you, it's normally distributed, right? Because I didn't give you any that were non-parametric. Uh, 
you know that it's not going to be chi-square because it's not uh, nominal or binary data. You only have two groups you're comparing. Well, actually, you have two groups, but technically it's the same person because it's before and after a new medication. So it's the paired t-test. See how easy this is? So easy. You're doing this in your sleep. OK, a little bit harder example. You're evaluating whether a new rapid diagnostic improves patient outcomes in MRSA bacteremia. Patients are divided into two group, uh, three groups. Rapid diagnostic test results, rapid diagnostic test plus active stewardship intervention, and then no intervention at all. The primary outcome is length of stay, which was not normally distributed. Which of the following statistical tests is most appropriate for analyzing this data set? So length of stay is not normally distributed, but it is a continuous variable. So we know it's going to be non-parametric. We have more than two groups we're looking at. We have three groups. This one's a bit harder because I don't think people are as familiar with this test. This is one of my favorite tests. Yeah, it's two. It's the Prescott-Wallace. See? Easy. You don't even need me. Other relevant statistical tests I did not um, go into, as I, basically because I'm not sure how beneficial it will be. I can always talk about them again if anyone wants me to, but correlation, linear regression, multiple, multivariable logistic regression, Kaplan-Meier survival analysis, and Cox proportional hazard analysis. You need um, statistical software for these. I mean, a lot of the other things I showed you, you can do in, in Excel and GraphPad, but I don't think you can do things like multivariable logistic regression in GraphPad. You might be able to do a Kaplan-Meier survival, but I think that's about it. Um, quickly, this is just an example of, uh, for the multivariable. It's confounding variables to sort the association between your variables of interest, like I said. This is an example of binary logistic regression. So I showed you these odds ratios earlier when we just looked at risk in the exposed versus unexposed. This is from the multivariable logistic regression where we accounted for these, all of these at the same time. <clears throat> So basically, we're saying, oh, if you're, you receive vancomycin, your odds of clinical failure are twofold higher than those received, than received aptomycin. But now, this adjusted odds ratio, this is saying that if you receive vancomycin and you accounted for the fact of whether or not you're in the ICU, you had source control, and you had a complicated bloodstream infection, now your odds are 2.4 times higher than those that received aptomycin because we're controlling for these additional confounding variables. Does that make sense? So that's why I like regression analysis. I recommend that if you have a sample size that you can do it in, after you do your bivariate, you reach out to someone, a statistician that can help you with it, because it will be much more, like, it will inform your data much more than just doing a simple crude analysis. Oh, interpretation of test results. I think we already talked about this a lot, but lack of statistical significance does not mean the results aren't important. Additional uh, statistical significance does not mean the results are not of clinical importance. And clinical importance addresses the relevance of a difference that exists. So the, you know statistical significance doesn't necessarily mean clinical significance. I think we've, we've uh, addressed that a lot. This is an example I got from Dr. Stafford, who, who presented to us recently. This is the um, interpretation of test results and being uh, careful about inferences. So this is a per capita cheese consumption versus a number of people who died because they're tangled in their bed sheets. They look highly correlated, but you have to be careful of inferences. So yeah, this is from a website with spurious correlations. These are some helpful websites um, that I've used when I've been working on different projects, except for GraphPad. I put that in there because everyone uses it. And with that, I'll take questions. Do you have the, do you have the little mic thing? So what tests do you recommend when determining if um, your results are normally distributed? Do you look at the, um, the standard error? And if so, like what is well, your cutoff or something? Like first thing I do is look at the histogram. It, you can just plot the histogram of your data. And if you look at, you can see the skewedness of the data. If it's visually skewed, that's, a, that's the biggest and easiest indicator. Um, so it's tough because, like, it gets a little gray because you can look at skewness and kurtosis. Um, I'm just saying. <laughs> There's different metrics you can look at for skewedness um, of your data. But the easiest one and the 
to eyeball it because some of your tests also, I didn't talk about this, but some of your tests say your t-test, it is kind of resistant to some of the assumptions being violated. So if it's, it's not too skewed and it looks fairly normally distributed, the t-test should still work for you. Does that make sense? So if you're looking at your mean and your median and they look <coughs> fairly similar and the data looks fairly similar on a histogram, I think that would be appropriate for you to proceed with a normally distributed or parametric test. Which one? Well, if they are, if you're looking at continuous data that is normally distributed between two groups that are independent, you can do a student t-test. So, no, go ahead. okay. Uh, there is a question from online. Well, this one. Um, so, is there are there any um, helpful stats computer programs out there for rookies? Like, would you recommend like SPSS or is there any uh, free things well, to use? I like SPSS because it's point and click. Um, the problem with SPSS is that the subscription's expensive. Um, I think if if the department can get one computer with SPSS on it, it would be worth it. It's it's three hundred and fifty dollars a year. But because it's point and click, it's really intuitive to use. Um, when I say point and click, I mean like the more robust programs like SAS. You can get SAS University free, but you have to know how to code that stuff. I have, I've, I struggle with that in my uh, stats classes every weekend for my homework. I spend hours spinning my wheels on this code. But SPSS is point and click, and I think it's fairly intuitive, and it's more robust than uh, GraphPad. Like my understanding is GraphPad can't do things like regression analysis. But some of your simple stuff you can do in Excel. And I believe there are free software programs that you can download for like simple tests. So obviously you can't do it for like multivariate notes, but I've heard like the R project one and like, uh, I'm trying to remember what the other one was, but there are some out there. R, right? you, R is free, but you have to code for that too. It's similar right. to uh, SAS that you have to know the code. But R is becoming pretty popular because it's free. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that? Doesn't look like there's any other questions. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully okay. people found that helpful. Yeah. Let me know if you did or didn't, because this is my first time trying to condense that information into a, a short PowerPoint presentation for practical application. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks.